guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering acid-base imbalances. Guys, I know a lot of you struggle with this, and I promise it's a lot easier than you think, okay? So this is what I'm going to be covering. You know what I'm about to say to you. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to like and subscribe below. Go ahead and press that bell. That's a notification button to let you know every time a new video is uploaded. All right, guys, so without any further ado, let's get started. First question. A which client is at greatest risk for acidosis? A, a 78-year-old client on diuretic therapy with furosemide. B, a 62-year-old client with moderate hypertension. C, a 75-year-old client with peptic ulcer disease. Or D, a 45-year-old client with pneumonia. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. If you're new to this channel, just go ahead, press the pause button. Think about your answer. Whenever you're ready, press play and we'll continue. All right, guys, so the correct answer is D, the 45-year-old client with pneumonia. So first things first, let's look at what the question's asking us. And they're asking us who's at risk for acidosis, okay? So the first thing I want you guys to realize, whenever we're talking about acidosis, what we're really talking about is CO2, okay? Carbon dioxide. Or if it helps you remember, think of it as carbon diacid right? Whenever we're talking about acidity, we're talking about CO2. The more CO2 that a patient has in their body, the more acid that they are, okay? The less CO2, then the less acidic, acidic that they are and they're more alkalinic, right? Are you guys with me? Okay, good. So now that we've established when we're talking about acidity, what we're really talking about is carbon dioxide and the lungs are responsible for carbon dioxide right not the kidneys the lungs the kidneys are responsible for bicarb but we're not talking about bicarb so we're not talking about the kidneys right now they're asking us about acidosis and we've established that when we're talking about acidosis we're talking about co2 and what's responsible for co2 the lungs so who would be at risk for acidosis someone with a lung problem, right? I want you to think about this. Every time you breathe out, what you're really breathing out is the CO2. Oxygen comes in your body, CO2 comes out. Oxygen comes in your body, CO2 comes out. Oxygen comes in your body and CO2 comes out. So whenever you have a problem with your lungs, such as pneumonia, you can't breathe the way you're normally supposed to breathe, right? So instead of breathing off all that CO2, what are you doing? You're keeping it in your body. If you're keeping that CO2 in your body, that CO2 gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what did I tell you CO2 is? Acidic. There's your answer right there. They're going to be at the highest risk to be acidic, the patient who's having problems with the lungs because the lungs are responsible for CO2. Okay, so um, I hope that kind of is starting to clear things up for you, but we got lots of questions to um, keep, keep us going. Next question. Which acid-base imbalance should you be prepared for in a client experiencing acute pancreatitis? A, metabolic acidosis. B, metabolic alkalosis. C, a respiratory acidosis or D, respiratory alkalosis. Now, I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, guys, is A, metabolic acidosis, and I'm gonna to explain to you why. Do you recall, I just told you that the kidneys are responsible for bicarb? That's your number one site of production for bicarb. But another important organ for bicarb production is the pancreas. Okay? So I want you to think about it. Follow me. If we know the pancreas is important in the production of bicarb, which is basic alkalosis, right? And the pancreas isn't working because the patient's got pancreatitis, what is that going to throw the patient into? 
acidosis because the pancreas is responsible for making bicarb but something's wrong with the pancreas it's not making the bicarb so it's gonna the patient's gonna go into the opposite direction so if the bicarb's over here it's making bicarb 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 now something's wrong it's not making bicarb anymore it's gonna push the patient to this side which is the opposite acidic okay and so your correct answer is metabolic acidosis. Why is it metabolic? We're not talking about the lungs. When we're talking about the lungs, we're talking about respiratory, right? Kidneys, pancreas, the organs that are responsible for a bicarb, it's going to be metabolic. So that's why this patient's in metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Why? Because if the bicarb production is down, and we know that because the pancreas isn't working, the patient's got pancreatitis. If the bicarb production is down, what's up? The acid. And guys, I know I'm just talking to you, so sometimes I know a lot of you are visual learners. And this is definitely going to be a two, maybe three part series. I ordered a whiteboard. I'm waiting for it to come, but I think it'll really help when you guys can get a visualization of what I'm explaining to you, but I'm trying my best. So please, I hope you're able to follow. Leave me a comment, guys. Leave me comments about this video just so I can have an idea of how well you're able to understand what I was saying to you. But I promise there's going to be a part two that will be a visual. So anyhow, the correct answer for number two is metabolic acidosis. And we know that because we know the pancreas is one of the organs responsible for bicarb production. If the pancreas isn't working the way it's supposed to, patient's going to go in acidosis. Okay. Um, number three, the lab data, which laboratory data and clinical manifestations cause you to suspect your client may be experiencing acidosis. One, a serum sodium of 130 in peripheral edema. Two, a, a serum sodium of 144 in tachycardia. Three, a serum potassium of 6.5 in flaccid paralysis. Or four, a serum potassium of 4.5 in hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, a serum potassium of 6.5 in flaccid paralysis. So there's something else you guys need to know. I hope you guys are taking notes, but it's going to make sense. I, if you um, look at your notes later and you might have to watch this video again, but just follow me. So guys, when a patient's going through acid doses, they also experience hyperkalemia along with acidosis. The potassium goes up. OK, your normal range for potassium is three point five to five. So your potassium shoots up. What are signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia? Nerve, muscle, relaxation, flaccid, uh, I can't even pronounce flaccidity, right? So we, um, when we see a patient going through hyperkalemia, which co comes along with the acidosis, a patient's going through acidosis, you expect to see the potassium increase, right? And we know those signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia, the high potassium of being more than five. Your range is 3.5 to five. The nerves and the muscles relax. But guess what? They relax a little bit too much. And we're dealing with what? Flaccidity. All right. So that's why you see um, flaccid and paralysis because everything's relaxed a little bit too much. Where the opposite, if the potassium was low, you'd see nerve and muscle excitability, irritation. But we're talking about acidosis right now. So with acidosis comes hyperkalemia and all of those signs and symptoms that accompany hyperkalemia. So you guys have to know your fluid and electrolytes well. You have to know what happens when they're up versus where they're down. So that's why your correct answer is serum potassium 6.5. We know that because they're asking us about acidosis. And we know when a patient goes through acidosis, we expect to see the potassium increase. And signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia, which is increased potassium, is um, 
flaccid and paralysis. You're going to see decreased nerve and muscle excitability. You're going to see decreased nerve and muscle irritation. Okay. Um, let's talk about our other choices because there's some other things I want you guys to know. It's very important that you know. Uh, choice A, serum sodium of 130. Well, you guys know what your serum um, normal level is, 135 to 140, 135 to 145, right? So this patient is experiencing hyponatremia because it's less than 130. So we're talking about A. It says serum sodium of 130 and peripheral edema. Well, um, with hyponatremia, you're, you don't see those signs and symptoms of acidosis, so that couldn't be your answer. Then choice two, you have a serum sodium of 144 and tachycardia. Well, that serum sodium, that's normal. You want your sodium to be 135 to 145, so that can't be a sign and symptom of acidosis. Then you have choice four, a serum potassium of 4.5. Well, guess what? That is a normal level. So that's not going to show signs and symptoms of acidosis either because, again, potassium range is 3.5 to 5. Anything more than 5 is hyperkalemia. And you, I talked about those signs and symptoms. Anything less than 3.5 is hypokalemia. And I already discussed those symptoms. All right, next question. The hand grasp of the client with acidosis has diminished since the previous assessment an hour ago. What is your best first action? One, assess the client's rate, rhythm, and depth of respiration. Two, measure the client's pulse and blood pressure. Three, document findings as the only action. Or four, notify the doctor. And I'll give you a moment to think of um, your answer, guys. And the correct answer is A, you want to assess the client's rate, rhythm, and depth of respirations. I want you to think about this. The question is asking us about acidosis, right? And I just went into detail and I said to you, when you're thinking of acidosis, right? What's up? The potassium. What does increased potassium cause? Muscle and nerve relaxation. It can cause even paralysis or flaccidity of the muscles and nerves, right? Are you guys following me? Well, everybody, whenever you think of potassium, the first thing that comes to your mind is heart, heart, heart. And it's true because your heart's a muscle, right? It's one of the strongest, biggest muscles in your body. Absolutely. But guess what? Do you know your respiratory muscles? That's what helps your lungs expand and that's what helps a patient to breathe. So who cares about the patient's heart if they're not breathing, A, B, C, airway. We got to make sure that patient's breathing. Yes, we care about the heart. And immediately after we make sure our patient's breathing, we're going to check the heart rate. But we want to make sure our patient is breathing. So we're going to check the respirations first because we know that along with acidity comes hyperkalemia. Along with hyperkalemia comes muscle and nerve relaxation decreased excitability. So we want to make sure those muscles that are supporting the respiratory system are working and that patient is breathing like they're supposed to. So the first thing we want to do is check the respirations, make sure that patient's breathing. Then of course, next, immediately after we're going to check the heart, we want to make sure the heart's beating, but we care about the breathing first. That's what we're going to check. Which process or condition is likely to have resulted in the arterial blood gas values below? So the pH is 7.12, the bicarb is 22, the PCO2 65, PO2 56. Choice A, diabetic ketoacidosis as a result of urinary tract infection in a patient with long-standing emphysema. Choice B, complete tracheal obstruction suffered as a result of aspiration of aspirating a hot dog. Choice C, anxiety-induced hyperventilation, or choice D, diarrhea for 36 hours. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. All right, now I got to go back to look at the question and see what they're even asking us. So which process or condition is likely to have resulted in the arterial blood gas? Okay. 
All right, so I hope you guys had a moment to look at um, the question and your choices. The correct answer is B, complete tracheal obstruction suffered as a result of aspirating a hot dog. Now, guys, I, um, I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted by uh, this camera. So um, let's talk about this. The person's choking on the hot dog. What happens when you're choking? You can't breathe, right? You can't breathe. You can't get rid of your CO2. So it stays inside of your body, which makes you what? Acidic. Remember we talked about CO2 being acidic. So that patient who can't breathe, they're holding on to their CO2 and they become acidic. Well, let's look at these um, lab values and you it'll reflect that. Look at the pH. The pH is 7.12. Your normal pH is supposed to be 7.35 to 7.45. So anything less than 7.35 is acidic. All right? And everything that your pancreas, that your kidneys, that your lungs do is to get the pH between 7.35 and 7.45. So you see the lungs shooting out CO2 is to get that pH between 7.35 and 7.45. You see your kidneys back here shooting out bicarb is to get that pH between 7.35 and 7.45. You see your pancreas shooting out that HCO3, that bicarb, is to get that pH between 7.35 and 7.45. Everything that our organs are doing are, is the whole purpose, the whole name of the game is to get the pH between 7.35 and 7.45. Anything less than 7.35, the patient's acidic. Anything more than 7.45, they're basic or alkalinic, okay? So when I look at the pH, and that's the first thing you're always gonna look at, always. Um, on my next video, when I do the visualization, it'll make more sense. But whenever you're being asked about um, compensation, decompensation, partial, all that good stuff, the first thing you are always going to look at is the pH because everything that everybody else is doing, the oxygen, the CO2, the bicarb, it's all to get the pH between what? 7.35 and 7.45. So when I look at this pH and I see it's 7.12, I know the patient's acidic. Without looking at anything else, I know the patient's acidic. I don't know yet if it's metabolic. I don't know yet if it's respiratory because I haven't looked at the other numbers, but just looking at the pH, I can tell that it's acidic. The pH is always gonna tell you if the patient's either acidic or basic slash alkalinic, right? So I look at the pH and I see it's 7.12. That tells me that the patient's what? Acidic. Okay, next I move on to the bicarb. Bicarb is 22. Well, the normal bicarb is 22 to 26. Nothing wrong with that. That's normal range. So I move on next to the PCO2. <gasps> 65? Well, the CO2 is supposed to be 35 to 45. That CO2 is way out of range. And what's responsible for CO2? The lungs. So that's how I know I'm dealing with respiratory. Okay, so now I know my patient is in respiratory acidosis. I know it's respiratory because the CO2 is out of whack and I know CO2, the lungs are responsible for CO2, so I know it's respiratory and I know it's acidosis because look at our pH, it's 7.12. In your normal range, it's supposed to be 7.35 to 7.45, okay? That 7.12 is way less than 7.35. So now I know my patient's going through respiratory acidosis. I don't even have to look at anything else. My patient's in respiratory acidosis, so I have to say to myself, what causes respiratory acidosis? Well, gee, I remember Professor D saying, anything that causes a patient not to be able to breathe, not to be able to expand their lungs, not to be able to breathe off CO2 and get rid of all that acid will make them hold it in and make them be acidic. There you go, B complete tracheal obstruction. That means no air is getting in and no air is getting what? Out. So instead of breathing off that CO2, the patient's keeping it in their lungs. Complete tracheal obstruction suffered as a result of aspirating a hot dog. That's your key, guys. So let's look at our other choices. You have one, diabetic ketoacidosis. 
as a result of the UTI in a person with long-standing emphysema. And let me tell you how they tried to throw you off because they put long-standing emphysema, right? So you're supposed to think, oh, emphysema, that's a respiratory problem. That must be it. Uh-uh. Go back to A. What do they have? Diabetic ketoacidosis. So yes, the patient has emphysema, but what they're going through? Diabetic ketoacidosis. What is that, guys? Diabetic ketoacidosis, that's metabolic acidosis. Metabolic, not respiratory. And what we're looking for in this question is respiratory acidosis. That's why one's not the answer. Let's move on to choice C, anxiety-induced hyperventilation. What happens when you hyperventilate? <laughs> You're blowing off all your what? CO2. When you don't have enough CO2, what are you? Basic, alkalinic. When your CO2 is down, what's up? Your bicarb, right? So that can't be the answer because again, we're looking for respiratory acidosis. Move on to choice four, diarrhea for 36 hours. Guys, base comes out the butt. So anytime somebody has diarrhea, what they're losing is all of their base because base comes out the butt so that throws them in if the base is down what's up the only thing that could be up the acid right metabolic acidosis can't be respiratory we're not talking about the lungs metabolic acidosis so the only thing we can the only answer could be is b the patient who couldn't breathe because they were choking on a hot dog because when you go back to the question and you look at the lab values, those lab values tell you that you're looking for somebody that's going through respiratory acidosis and B is the answer to respiratory acidosis. Okay. All right. Which clients at risk for development of metabolic acidosis? metabolic acidosis. So we're not talking about the lungs. Remember the lungs respiratory, right? We're talking about metabolic. We're talking about the kidneys or possibly the pancreas, right? A, a 56 year old male with chronic asthma. B, a 36 year old male hiking in the Canadian Rockies. C, a 36 year old female on a carbohydrate free diet. Or D, a 56-year-old female self-medicating with sodium bicarb for gastroesophageal reflux. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is C, the 36-year-old female on a carb-free diet. So let's go back to the question, guys. Remember, they're looking for somebody who is experiencing metabolic acidosis. Did you guys know anyone who is on a very strict, stringent, severe diet? What happens is when their body can't um, get the energy that it needs, it starts eating away at that patient's um, muscle. It starts eating away at that patient's uh, fat. You want to know what that bicarb of the breakdown of them eat of, of their body wasting away? Acidosis. That's what happens. So what happens is the breakdown, anybody who's on a strict diet, so they're on a strict diet, no carbs. They're on a strict diet, no fat. Your body has to get the energy from somewhere. So if it can't get the fat, it's going to start eating away at the muscles. And the breakdown of that eating away of the muscle. That's what's known as catabolism, right? The byproduct of that breakdown of the muscles breaking down or the fat breaking down is acidic. So that throws the patient in a metabolic acidosis. Can't be the lungs. We're not talking about respiratory, right? It throws the patient into metabolic acidosis. Okay. Why? Because any strict diet, I'm talking about, um, the keto diet, perfect example, these patients who are on the, um, I think it's called the keto diet, right? They're not, they don't eat any carbs at all, right? Guess what your body starts to break down? It starts to break down your fat, right? And that's why people lose weight at first because that fat's being break, broken down. But the breakdown, the catabolism of that fat causes acidosis, ketones 
keto acidosis keto diet okay anyway so that is the answer to our question now i want to go through the other choices so you can understand why the other choices are wrong remember we're looking for someone going through metabolic acidosis choice one someone's chronic asthma if someone has asthma chronic asthma they can't breathe right they can't breathe the way they're supposed to they're not releasing co2 the way that they're supposed to so the co2 builds up builds up builds up in their system and so that type of patient goes through what respiratory acidosis not metabolic we're looking for metabolic so it can't be a choice b a patient a 36 year old male hiking in the canadian rockies so they're hiking somewhere in the mountains up high right where you're up high you, your your lungs aren't expanding the way um, they should. You can't breathe as well. The higher that you go, the harder it's going to be for you to breathe. So guess what? The patient, instead of releasing all of those CO2 that's in the lungs, they're holding on to that CO2, and that CO2 is building up, building up, building up. And that patient goes through what? Respiratory acidosis. Let's look at choice uh, four. Where were we? Okay, choice four. 56-year-old female self-medicating with sodium bicarbonate. So the patient has GERD and they're taking sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarb, what is bicarb? Basic. So if the patient's taking sodium bicarb, they have what? Alkalosis. Sodium bicarb is basic, so this patient's going through metabolic alkalosis. So that can't be the answer because what we were looking for was metabolic acidosis. So the correct answer is choice C. And guys, the reason I'm going over the other choices because you might get a test question. They might flip it on you. They might not be asking about metabolic acidosis. They might be asking about metabolic alkalosis. And I just want to make sure that you understand each situation. And guys, this is not something that you can memorize. So don't even try. Understand it so no matter how it's flipped to you on a test question, you'll be able to answer the question correctly. Which client is most at risk for the development of acute respiratory acidosis? A, a 58-year-old man with allergic rhinitis and sinusitis. B, a 28-year-old woman with type 1 diabetes who has a UTI. C, a 68-year-old woman who has long-standing emphysema and is now undergoing continuous NG suctioning. Or D, a 38-year-old man, 6 feet 7 inches in height, being mechanically ventilated with a tidal volume of 500 mLs at 15 breaths per minute. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is D, the 38-year-old man with a tidal volume of 500 mLs um, at 15 breaths per minute. And remember, they're asking us about who's at risk for developing respiratory acidosis. So we know we're talking about something that, to do with the lungs, right? All right. So this patient, choice D, look at that tidal volume, 500. For a patient that's six feet, seven inches their patient's mechanically ventilated it should be between eight to nine hundred so that tidal volume is way too low so you want to know what that means that means they're holding on to all of their co2 instead of it coming out of their body so they're at risk for respiratory the lungs acidosis holding on to too much co2 Let's look at our other choices, guys. We have A, a 58-year-old man with allergic rhinitis and sinusitis. That should not really affect um, their um, pH balance. They got a little bit of runny nose and allergies. B, the woman with type 1 diabetes. We talked about this already. You hear diabetes. You better already be thinking about what? Metabolic um Me metabolic acidosis but let's keep go going diabetes who has a uti diabetes that's metabolic acidosis now what we're looking not what we're looking for which is respiratory acidosis next choice choice c the 60 year 68 year old with long-standing emphysema okay i'm thinking oh long-standing emphysema they can't breathe that's respiratory acidosis so let's keep going and this is how they got you this is how they trick you they're now undergoing continuous NG suctioning. 
that's your key to let you know it's not really respiratory acidosis like we thought at first. What is NG suctioning? That's um, when the patient's getting their stomach contents suctioned, removed. What is your stomach contents? Acidic. When you eat food, it's the acid that breaks your food down. Your stomach produces acid to break down the food. So if you have something that's pulling out all that acid out of your stomach, if the acid is decreased, what's increased? Base. Alkalinic right so even though this patient for choice c they're telling us that the patient has long standing emphysema that's just a distractor because if you keep reading they say that the patient's going through continuous ng suction and we know if a patient's going through continuous ng suction all of their acid is being pulled out of their body and that's going to throw them into an alkalinic state but for this question we're looking for somebody in an acidic state and more uh, specifically when we they're looking for acidic they're looking for respiratory acidosis and it's that patient who's mechanically ventilated but the settings are too low and they're holding on to their co2 so they're going to be at risk for respiratory acidosis Okay, guys, we are down to our last question, but I promise there are going to be more. I'm going to make a part two and it will have visuals, guys. So it's going to help to solidify the information that you've learned in this video. Okay, so last question. What is a priority diagnosis for a client, di for a client with severe metabolic alkalosis? A, risk for over sedation related to inadequate cerebral oxygenation. B, fluid volume deficit related to excess fluid loss during rapid respiration. C, risk for impaired skin integrity related to accompanying peripheral edema. Or C, risk for injury related to increased neuronal sensitivity from accompanying hypocalcemia. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is D, risk for injury related to increased neuronal sensitivity from accompanying hypocalcemia. So this is something else that's important for you to know. Just like when we were talking about acidosis, you learn that when a patient's in an acidic state, the potassium's up. Well, when the patient is in an alkalinic state, a basic state, the opposite of acid, right? When the patient is in an alkalinic state, the calcium is down. What happens is the patient goes through alkalosis and the calcium binds and it causes hypocalcemia. And so again, guys, you have to know your fluid and electrolytes and you have to know what happens when they're up versus when they're down. Because just like I told you, when a patient goes through alkalosis, along with the alkalosis comes hypocalcemia, you have to know the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. What does hypocalcemia cause? It causes nerve and muscle excitation, irritation, right? So what kind of signs and symptoms do you see? Possible seizures, right? Because remember, we're talking about the nerves, neuro, okay? Muscle and nerves. So you can see seizures, tetany. Remember tetany? Trove text sign, true souls. Trove text signs, that's the one where you touch your cheek and they're going like that. Why? Because of that muscle and nerve irritation. Or you take their blood pressure and you see their hands start to go like this. That's a true soul sign, right? All of those signs are si all of those are signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. And hypocalcemia comes with alkalosis. Just like hyperkalemia goes along with acidosis. So guys, there's so much more that I want to cover and I want to repeat and review with you just to make sure that the information you've learned has been solidified. So guys, I promise you, I'm going to be making a part two. Make sure you look out for it. In the meantime, if you want to support me, you want to support this channel, you want these videos to keep coming, please share these videos, like and subscribe below and make sure you press that notification button so you'll know next time a video's been uploaded. Guys, thank you for spending this time with me and I'll see you on the next video.